King Solomon was mentioned in our opening reading. King Solomon is one of the most well-known kings mentioned in the entire Bible. Even among non-believers and those who know very little about God's word will have likely heard of him at some point in their lives. Who was he? When did he reign? You don't need to give me the dates, but which, in the line of secession, which king was he? Was he the first, second, third, fifth, anybody know, of Israel? Close? Third. The first king of Israel was who? Saul, King Saul. Who was the second? David, Saul's son-in-law. And the third was David's son, Solomon. Solomon was the son of David and Bathsheba. You know, we know the story of uh, Bathsheba well and how David committed a great sin against not only God, but also Uriah, who was Bathsheba's husband. He committed adultery with her. And, and then he tried to hide his sins, both from God and from others. And his sins were found out. And we know how that story goes. And yet here we see how God was able to take a terrible situation and make something good out of it. Solomon was born to them. Solomon, who would become king. Solomon, whose name means what? Does anyone know? It comes from the Hebrew word shalom. Peace. His kingdom was the kingdom of peace. He was the king. And God blessed him with great peace. Now there was something else that his kingdom was known for. What two things was his kingdom especially known for? How, how was his kingdom different? There was two things that he had more in, than any other kingdom or king. Wisdom and riches. Yeah, wisdom and riches. Now I have a question for you. And be careful, it might be a trick one. Which one of these did he earn? Neither. He earned neither. He received them. He received them from God, his wisdom and his riches. How? He received these two things from God because God was greatly impressed and pleased with his answer. He sought God's kingdom. In our opening text from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Jesus encourages his listeners to not worry about their material needs, but rather to seek first God's kingdom and to trust that God would provide for, for, for the rest, their material needs. And, and within this promise, Jesus refers to Solomon, King Solomon, by stating that the splendor of Solomon's riches, and he was seen as the, the most wealthy king of his time, and, and probably, perhaps, relatively speaking, throughout history, and yet... His wealth and his riches and his splendor dimmed in comparison to the beauty of what? A lily. Compared to the beauty of a lily of the field. And do the lilies of the field worry about how beautiful they will be? They don't. They don't toil. They don't spin. They simply do what God made them to do. And God does the rest. Their beauty is greater than that of Solomon's riches. In our study this morning, we will see that if we first seek God's kingdom, like Solomon did, and we'll look at that in greater detail, what that means, then God promises to take care of our material needs as he did for Solomon. To start us off, we want to look at our text again. Verse 33, Jesus says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Loved ones, this is exactly what Solomon did. I don't know if we've ever thought about this. He sought first God's kingdom. In 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5, we read that after having offered God a sacrifice of a thousand animals, is what scripture says, God appeared to Solomon in a dream and said, Ask, what shall I give you? He could ask for anything. And because Solomon felt so overwhelmed at the idea of having to lead God's people, 
He says to God in verse 9, Therefore give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil for who is able to judge this great people of yours? Solomon was offered anything that he could wish for. And his greatest concern was the well-being of God's kingdom, God's people. That Jesus includes the words first and seek first is very important for us to take note of. It comes from the Greek word proton and entails the idea of order of importance. It means prioritizing. It means before and at the beginning. Okay, So when we prioritize our lives, we put first God's kingdom. It means considering everything we have, everything we do, everything that we desire, everything that we want to do in our lives, our goals and our accomplishments. And after we've considered all of these things, we place them in order of importance, and then we put God and his kingdom at the front of it. That's what it means to seek first God and his kingdom. Then we live our lives in such a way that God's kingdom is furthered and God is glorified. One author writes, to seek the kingdom of God above else means to put God first in your life. It means to fill your thoughts with his desires. It means to take his character for your pattern it means to serve and obey him in everything. And then this author asks us, his readers, what is really important to you? People, objects, goals, and other desires all compete for priority. Any of these can quickly come, become most important to you if you don't actively choose to give God first place in every area of your life. Loved ones, it's so easy for us to say God is our first priority. But as the, this author says, we need to actively live this out. We need to actively, every day, make this decision. When we're faced with different things that want to become first in our lives, we say, no, God, you are first. Your kingdom is first. We need to constantly make this decision for the Lord. Because if we don't, I promise you, other things will creep in and they will become a greater priority to us than God and his kingdom. We must constantly make this decision in our lives. No, God comes first. His kingdom comes first. And I recognize that prioritizing our lives in this way can be challenging. It can be. For example, I've had people tell me in the past, they say, yeah, God is my first priority, and then my family, and then the church. And I think it's wonderful that these would make the top three of our priorities. But I, I, just, I just want to caution us this morning that maybe it's a dangerous thing to divide these three things this way. And let me explain myself in a bit. In Malachi chapter 2, verse 15, the prophet uses the picture of the family to symbolize the kind of relationship that God wants to have with his people but these words in Malachi 2.15 also show us that family is something special, is something special to God. Our families are something special to God. And we know that, uh, that he created the family. How do we know that? Yeah, he created everything. First he created which person? Then Eve. He created Eve for Adam. And then he blessed them with a union and said, go forth and multiply, meaning start families. This is something from God. And because the family is, is created by God, given by God, we can say it is a thing of God. It's a wonderful thing of God. And what happens when our children find the Lord? They'd be good too, yeah. What are they added to? God's family. They're added to God's family, right? Is it not the greatest desire 
of, of ours as parents that our children would find the Lord and serve the Lord with all their hearts? And doesn't that require taking them to church? Putting them around other like-minded believers so that they can be encouraged in their walk with the Lord? So that they could be refreshed every week under his word? Loved ones, we ought not to be dividing these things, God and, and, and our family and the church. They're intertwined in, in, in such special ways. The family is, is of God. And when our children become Christians, they belong to his family. And it's our responsibility as parents to lead them in their walk with the Lord until they're at the age where they can walk themselves with to the Lord. We ought never to use our families as an excuse for, for backing out of our commitments to God and, and His church. And sometimes we're tempted to do that. We say, you know, I can't come to church regularly because we need family time or whatever it is. I promise you, training up your children in the ways of the Lord is the best investment that you could possibly do for them. And part of that includes bringing them to church. Do we agree? Yeah. We want to help each other. Train up the next generation for the Lord. Now if we go back to our text, we read that we are to not only seek first God's kingdom, but also to seek first his righteousness. And Solomon not only placed God's people before everything else, he sought godly wisdom so that he could lead God's people in a way that pleased God. Solomon says to God in 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 7 to 9, he says, Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, but I am a little child in comparison. I do not know how to go out or to come in, mean to, meaning to rule God's people. And then he says, and your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to judge this great people of yours? So Solomon sought godly wisdom so that he could care for God's people in a righteous way, in a just way, as God desired. And likewise, loved ones, Jesus instructs us to seek his righteousness. When I think of seeking first God's righteousness, two thoughts come to mind, okay? First, to seek God's righteousness means that we must first receive his righteousness. And how do we receive Christ's righteousness? Through? Through Christ, right? I mean, we become righteous before the Lord through Christ. We know that if we believe in Jesus Christ, who he is and what he did for mankind, that he died for the sins of all, and then if we bring our, our sins to him and, and seek his forgiveness in faith, God promises to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. And uh, that happens through Jesus Christ. And Paul says likewise in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 21, for he made him who knew no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So he became like us. He took our unrighteousness, our sins upon himself, Jesus did, and then died for our sins on Calvary so that we could become righteous in Christ before God. Now the second thought that comes to mind when I think about uh, what it means to seek God's righteousness is that after we received Christ's righteousness, our desire ought to be to live righteously. Now this means that everything we do ought to be acceptable in God's eyes. And this thought might seem overwhelming to us at first, but all it really means is that we obey God and his word out of fear, out of love, out of love. By this all will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another, and then on a different spot it says, if you keep my word. Others will know that you love me. Out of love. It also means that we have a desire to continually grow in our relationship with the Lord. 
in our knowledge of God and in our walk with Christ. And that we learn to trust God and depend on him, believing that he is the great provider. All good things come from our Father up above, is what James says. Do we believe that? That requires trust, loved ones. It does. When times go well, when our bank accounts are full, right, it's, just, it's easy to believe that. But when those financially trying times come our way or unexpected tragedies come our way, do we still trust the Lord? Do we still believe that all good things come from above? God wants to provide for us. We read earlier in verse 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And if we look at the verses 25 to 32 again, we see that Jesus was talking about all of our daily material needs. Let me read verse 25 for us again. Verse 25 of our opening text says, Therefore I say to you, this is God Almighty, the creator of heaven and, and, heaven and earth and, and everything in between. He says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Is our life not more than material things? You know, I saw a, a comic the other day on Facebook, and, and it made me think. There's a picture of a man chasing money, and there's, there's money blowing in the wind, all these bills, and he's trying all he can to, to grasp these bills. And, and then there's another picture un, un, underneath, and his hands are full, but he's reached the end of his life. His cliff is, the cliff is there. It goes no further. What is he going to do with all that money that he's co collected in his hands? Loved ones, life is far more than the pursuit of material things. God has a great plan for us. He wants to bless us with heavenly treasures. He wants us to collect these heavenly treasures for him because they're eternal. They'll go into the everlasting. So let's not be fooled into just chasing after the things of this world because they are fleeting and our souls are eternal. Jesus had just told his listeners, in our text, Matthew 6, to always put God and the things of God first in their lives. And yet he realized for his, for his listeners to be able to, uh, to do this, they needed faith in God's providing. Therefore, he shared these words of comfort with them. Now, he didn't want his followers who placed God and heavenly treasures before material treasures to worry about their daily needs. For worrying can become a great stumbling block for a Christian. Is that true? How does worrying hurt us in our Christian walk? It takes up a whole lot of time that we could be using for other things, right? For the Lord. What else? Oh, great. I love all the answers. Dis distracts us, right? What else? Very, very good. What else? Creates doubt in God's provision, right? Yeah, it distracts us, takes our focus off of what's important, all of these things. What about our physical health? Does worrying affect our physical health? What does it do to us? It makes, it, it tires us. Makes us happy. Stresses us out. Who here has ever lost sleep because of worrying about something? I think everybody it takes our sleep away, takes our joy in the Lord away, and it's just useless. Jesus says, I know what you're going through. I know what you need. Bring those things to me, as we heard in the song. I love you. Let me provide. And then be useful in some other way. Worrying is incredibly detrimental to our, to our lives, to our health, and to our Christian walk. Jesus wanted to instill within the hearts of his followers a deep dependency on God and an unwavering faith in his providing. And that's why he gives us multiple beautiful examples and illustrations from the natural world of how the Lord provides for his creation. He says in verse 26, Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into the barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them are you not of more value than they? And loved ones, we know that we are of much greater value than the birds because of what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10. 
verses 29 to 31. He continues this thought and he says, Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear. Therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. You know what? Some people take this verse and say that, okay, if we trust the Lord to provide for us, he will never allow us to face hardships in life. That's not true. Right? The sparrows do fall to the ground at times. But somehow they're in God's perfect will. And we can trust him that he knows what he's doing and that he promises to get us through even the hardest of times. Because he loves us and his love for us is far greater than God's love for his creation, his natural world. Now to further prove this point, Jesus includes another illustration. He says in verses 28 to 30, Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field with the beautiful lilies, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Loved ones, the richest king in Israel's history wasn't as beautifully clothed as the grass of the field, as the lilies of the grass. Let's for a moment consider Solomon's riches. Well, we're given a bit of an overview in 1 Kings chapter 10. For example, in verse 21, I won't read that whole section, but I'll share a few verses. Verse 21 says, All King Solomon's drinking vessels were gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Not one was silver, for this was accounted as nothing in the days of Solomon. Can you imagine every vessel that you drank out of to be pure gold? And to not make them out of silver because that was considered as, as garbage, as trash. I mean, how rich was this guy? And then if we continue reading verse 23, verse 23, uh, scripture continues this a description of his wealth. And it says there, So King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. So God blessed Solomon with wisdom and wealth because Solomon's answer pleased the Lord. And likewise, God promises to provide for all of our daily needs if we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Now, please understand me. I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel this morning. I'm not saying that if we seek first the kingdom of God, we're going to be richer than Solomon. No. But our spiritual treasures will, by far, outshine anything that Solomon had. He promises to provide for our physical needs and he promises to bless us with heavenly treasures if we seek first his kingdom. And Jesus doubles down on this promise by stating that the splendor of Solomon can't be compared to the beauties of the lilies of the field whom God provides for. And I came across this, this uh, description or illustration regarding the beauty of our creation and I thought I would share it with you this morning. Just just listen to this. This professor writes, Creation contains an astonishing abundance and variety of beauty that constantly surprises and delights us. Every individual tree is a work of art, yet trees come in an immense variety of sizes and colors and shapes. Each day we're bombarded not just by beautiful sights of cedars and oaks and firs, but by sundry smells of wildflowers and ripening fruit or the sweet sounds of songbirds and rustling wind. The deeper we explore our world, the more beauty we find. The beauty of creation also shows that God cares deeply for man. And this is why Jesus encouraged his listeners to look at how God had clothed flowers so that they themselves would not worry about their own clothing. When you think of the detailed care that God has put into creating beauty, and then remember that men and women are the pinnacle of God's creation, it confirms just how much God must care for every detail of his children's needs. Is there anything about our lives that God does not care about? Who cares about the flowers of a field? God sees them. And he cares for us and he sees us. He says every one of the hairs of our heads are numbered by God. Every part of our lives are deeply important to God. 
And that's why, as we heard at the beginning, through that song, it's so important that we bring our needs to the Lord. Pour out our hearts to God. He knows the things that we're concerned about. He knows what we're going through. He knows what we need. And because he, he's, he's able and willing, we can trust him that he will provide for everything we need. Jesus attributes worrying to a lack of faith in God's providing. Worrying never helps us. Jesus asks a very good question. It might seem silly to us, but it's a good one. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? Okay? I'm sure I would be much taller if I was measured by the times I've worried in my life. In the same way, loved ones, that worrying will not help us to grow physically, it will never help us to grow spiritually. It will always hinder our walk with the Lord. And Jesus says in verses 31 to 32, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. The Gentiles are after these physical, fleeting things. And when they're able to, to accumulate all of them as much as they want, they then praise themselves for having earned all of those things. But God's children are different. As we heard earlier, God's children know that all good things come from our Father up above, as James says in James 1.17. And if we truly believe this, then we will also believe that God will always provide for us if we place first him, his kingdom, and his righteousness in our lives. Now, there's a sign in my office, and I have to thank Nancy for that. She decorated my office. And it says on that sign, I do not know what tomorrow holds, but who knows how that continues. Amen. I do not know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. Our wonderful Lord. We can trust him. By placing God and his kingdom as the first priority in our lives, we display to God our love for him and his kingdom above all other things. We show him that we have built our lives on Jesus Christ, that firm foundation, and have perfect confidence and perfect peace that he will help us to weather any storm or any challenge that we might ever face. Because he knows us. He loves us. And he promises to provide for us. By placing his kingdom and his righteousness first, we reveal to God that we take our Christian walk seriously. We take it seriously. And our commitments to God we place first. With God and his kingdom as our first priority, we trust that God will provide for all of our needs. And when hardships come our way, we choose rather to place our faith in the Lord than to worry about tomorrow. Because tomorrow isn't promised us anyhow. Loved ones, Jesus loves us far more than the birds of the air. He loves us far more than the grass of the field. And if he takes care of them, surely, surely our wonderful Lord will provide for our needs as well. The riches of Solomon are nothing compared to the blessings that God wants to bestow on us if we place his kingdom first and seek his righteousness in all things. This is a promise made by God himself. Amen.